Rossman, and I'm your new uh, Vertical Flight Society president, president, and I welcome you here today to this very special event. Afterwards, we will have lunch and um, also tour of the museum over at the Moffitt Field Museum. So it's just two blocks away, so once you go out the front doors here, you're going to go over to your right. Um, and with further ado, with someone that needs no introduction at all, the biggest day of the year, here is Dr. Robert Ormiston. Well, thank you, Natasha. I'm overwhelmed uh, with this incredible welcome. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, this has really been a long journey, as some of my co-authors can attest. Um, I want to recognize my co-editor, Irv Sattler. It means a lot to me for him to be here today, and I know for many of you. Uh, I would say, don't think of me as a presenter today. Think of me as a stand-in for the two of us. <clears throat> I'm also a stand-in for all the other of our 39 contributors in the book. I'd also like to thank Oliver Wong, our current Ames Army Lab leader, who managed not to be on travel and could join us today <laughs> and bring a few Army visitors from Huntsville uh, uh, today, including Rusty Graves and some other ones. I want to mention that Oliver's predecessor, Barry Lakensmith, is the one who coined the title of our book. I didn't see Barry. I don't know if he's here today or not. Uh, but the title, The Figures of Merit, are the scientists, engineers, technicians, secretaries, test pilots, managers, visionaries, and leaders who built a unique interagency collaboration under the Army-NASA joint agreement at Ames Research Center. It really started a new age of rotary wing technology. Now, the book itself collects the stories about the Army-NASA collaboration at Ames by and about the people who lived it. These were university fresh outs, experienced NACA researchers, and helicopter industry veterans learning together under leaders with creative vision and instinctive management skills. So how did this all get started? Well, really behind it all, I think, is the fact that most of us tend to think that the Army-NASA relationship is really something special, and that Ames is pretty much the center of the universe for rotorcraft research. So it's really a story that needed to be told. In 2014, Young Yu, Army friend, organized the Army Retirees Lunch. So we get together every few months. And Irv and I found out that we had a common interest in the Army-NASA story. So I proposed to Irv that we write a history, and Irv came back and said, hey, I've already written a personal memoir, and I've got a chapter in the Army. Why don't we do a memoir instead? So I won't discuss the negotiations and how that all got resolved. <laughs> I worked for him for 14, 15 years, so he was my boss. I guess I still think of him as my boss. So in April 2016, we agreed to explore the idea of a memoir, focused on the early years, 65 to 85, although that changed a little to tell these stories. So how did this, how did this go about? What was the process and, and how, did it, how did it proceed? It turned out to be kind of an unexpected odyssey. Odyssey because it took way longer than we thought. Although the actual contact time for writing was pretty much in the ballpark. But we sent out in April of 2016 a call to all our Army Lab con colleagues to see if they were interested. And the response was really enthusiastic. In July, we held a planning meeting to establish guidelines on how long should the chapters be, and what should the content, and all of that, and uh, we, we had it all well defined. August 1st was the official launch date, and we planned to be finished December 2017, 16 months. Along the way, we expanded the scope to include NASA folks associated with the Army, and Tom Snyder helped us with identifying the right people to, to include there. In July of 2016, Frank Caradonna drafted the first chapter, and it was a gem. It was kind of the model for the rest of the chapters that followed. Uh, most of them were gems. A few of them, uh, well, that's where the editors have <laughs> So, in some cases, it was kind of like herding cats. Uh, some went pretty far afield. The guidelines sort of fell apart. Bill Warmbrock gave me a lot of flack about this. So we're doing the best we can, Bill. 
uh, the story about uh, Mike Scully. I was reviewing his chapter, and I said, Mike, uh, we, we decided that Tilt Rotor would be Tilt Rotor. And he said, no it isn't, Tilt Rotor is Tilt Rotor. And if you're not going to change to Tilt Rotor, I'm out of here. <laughs> so I went to our editor, Kathy Dow, and she said, I guess we can make an exception for Mike. So the end is an eclectic mix that captures really, I think, the essence of the Army NASA experience. We've got examples of everybody included. I really have to mention that Kathy Dow did an enormous job. Bill uh, Warmbrandt recommended her, uh, and she did a fantastic job. It took a long time for her to do the editing part. Uh, and then even more, the NASA publication process, the GPO printing and all, that took almost a year. I was just about thinking we're, we're never going to make it. And then finally, yesterday, GPO delivered the book, so it's here. I, was, I might say that authors who pick up a copy today, others who want a copy, if we have, we'll let you have it, otherwise sign up on a card and we'll get a copy to you. Okay, there, here's two slides that show the contributors. This is amazing. We've got 39 people that contributed. We've got NASA Ames directors, we've got uh, Army Lab directors, we've got uh, the top technical people, we've got the secretaries, the technicians, Pretty much everybody. The people that are highlighted in yellow are actually going to talk for a few minutes after me and give you their insights about the organization. The green and blue dots show the people that essentially started off in the Army. Many of them switched to NASA. A few of them on the next page were actually NASA people uh, and, and uh, you know contributed as well. Now. The start of this was actually the Army Aeronautical Research Laboratory, and this was established as the Army activity in February 65 here at Ames. Colonel Stapleton was the commander, Paul Yagi, a longtime NACA and NASA uh, researcher, was named technical director in September 65. And then the name was changed in 67 to AARL. Uh, the picture shows Yagi being sworn in by Colonel Stapleton, and the man in the middle in the back is uh, Smitty de France, the director of Ames at the time. Uh, the Army NASA collaboration benefited both both agencies. The Army, or at essentially no cost for facilities and only about 30 people, the Army had an operational R&D capability within three years of signing the joint agreement. NASA, on the other hand, augmented its aeronautical research and support staff at Ames at no direct cost. So there was an efficient sharing of personnel and facilities for research toward common objectives, and the direct personal interaction collaborations created a stimulating environment for high-quality R&D. Now, the organizations above and at Ames and the names changed over the years, and it's really hard to keep track of this. John Davis helped me a lot with the Army history, uh, and I'll just point out that after, after Paul retired, Irv Statler became the director. Uh, the organization was expanded to other NASA centers under the Army Air Mobility Research and Development Laboratory. The headquarters were at Ames. Dick Carlson was the director after, our, after Paul retired. And at one point, the, the command structure in St. Louis was actually a research and development command at Arctic. And Major General Story Stevens, who wrote one of the forewords, was the commander. And Irv has many stories in his chapter about the relationship he had with General Stevens. Went too far. So how did the agreement work? The Army provided office, NASA provided office space in the number two 7x10 wind tunnel, support services, and other things in the Ames environment. The Army provided scientists and engineers who worked separately and within the NASA organizations. Army also provided support personnel to NASA to offset the cost of the Army's presence. And there were three groups in the Army. The AARG, that was researchers in Building 215, working pretty much independent of NASA. The JARG, or Joint Group, comprised of researchers that were integrated into NASA organizations and worked with their counterparts and, and reported to NASA managers. Then the technical support group, also Army people, integrated into the NASA organizations. And the collaboration and the relationship was so close that Army personnel could actually hold NASA positions. And the bottom picture shows Bill Ballhouse, an Army employee who was promoted to a NASA branch chief, 
in Vic Peterson's division, Vic being the chief of the Thermo and Gas Dynamics Division, and I believe Vic is right here with us today, and he wrote a, an interesting chapter on that actual process. So in the beginning, what was life like in Building 250? Well, we just had some amazing people. Georgie Lobb was an engineer. You read Frank's chapter, the first time he came to the lab, he found her practicing her unicycle in the halls, holding herself up by the walls. Don Adams was in charge of our computer, an IBM 1800, 50K memory, and he just worried that we weren't spending enough time using it, and the Army was going to take it away from us. Well, that changed pretty quick. Alice Tice was in administration. Bob George, representative of the tremendous instrumentation people we had. And Gene Wells, uh, the, the, the inimitable Gene Wells, represented the wind tunnel mechanics and kept the wind tunnel operation going. And it, things were informal back then. We didn't have a quality of life group or whatever. We just got together as employees to have picnics or get together as friends. And the picture on the right shows on the left, Ken McAllister and his wife, Frank Caradonna, you won't recognize them, they're so young. Larry Carr, Fred Schmitz and his wife, and Jim McCroskey and Betty. Uh, that was in, around 74. So, <clears throat> the emphasis is really on fundamental research in the beginning. And I, I just look back at Jim McCroskey. When I came in 68, he'd already been here a year and a half. He was my mentor. He came from Princeton, and he was the first researcher who really started to establish the reputation of the Army lab. And he did really fundamental research in battery layers and dynamic stall. And I love the picture that Kim McAllister took of it being inundated by paper from the visit quarter uh, during one of the tests. He also had an approach to research to break the helicopter problem into small bits. And he attacked them one by one. He ended up uh, tackling the dynamic stall problem. And the team on the bottom left shows uh, Larry Carr and Kim McAllister and Jim with Jim's big four-foot oscillating airfoil studying dynamic stall. In the middle between, on, on the right of the picture, is uh, Jean-Jacques Philippe. He was uh, part of the French MOU. And we had all of these MOUs going, and a big part of the, the Army-NASA relationship, uh, and, and a great contributor to, contributor to our reputation. But as part of the collaboration, Jean-Jacques brought his sister over to visit one time. She ended up meeting on it a guy in California, and she got married. So the, the relationship between the Army and NASA really worked out well for a lot of people. <laughs> now, I get involved in rotorcraft dynamics research in actually uh, kind of an unusual way. I got assigned to the test of the Lockheed Cheyenne helicopter, the 40 Betty wind tunnel. And this is an example of the Cheyenne problems. The Army had access directly to NASA facilities, so right away, they scheduled the aircraft in the tunnel. And I worked with Jim Biggers, one of the first of two NASA rotorcraft researchers um, and, and in, prep, in preparation for this test. Uh, I learned a lot from Jim and his cohort, John McLeod. Uh, but the test ran into troubles, and, and the helicopter uh, had an accident in the wind tunnel. And actually, I missed uh, being decapitated by three feet when the tip weight from the rotor blade came through the tunnel wall into the control system passed over my head. Well, that experience, uh, we realized we really didn't know enough about these kinds of helicopter rotors. So there's a long story that I'm not going to go into about all the helicopter <coughs> dynamics research we did, experimentally and analytically. And the picture in the bottom right shows the team in the wind tunnel, and I just point out Dave Sharp, Mike McNulty, and Bill Basman, uh, who were stalwarts in the group. And Bill led the experimental group and did incredible work in, in dynamic stability of uh, ground and air resonance before he moved on to the rotor loads problem in the US-60, but that's a whole other story. Let him tell it someday. Okay, the acoustics team. Well, I just want to show the pictures here. As Fred Schmitz was the leader, he was one of the ring leaders, Jim, myself, and Fred. It was aerodynamics, dynamics, and acoustics. And Fred is full of ideas all the time. And on the left, it shows him talking to Andy Morris, our great uh, Army group leader. And I, can, I just love this picture. It's just a, so much Fred Schmitz, always coming up with a new plan. And notice that Andy looks kind of skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other team members, there's, there's Fred with Young Yu, Fred with uh, Boxwell, and Randy Voss. And then Fred came up with the Anacoa cover facility. I call it Fred's folly. It was great for testing rotors. 
uh, but it wasn't great for the airflow. He figured he had a way to control the flow in and out of that room to simulate the rotor in free air conditions, but it didn't work a darn, worth a darn, so we never used that part. But it did contain all the rotors that we tried to break in the concrete facility. <clears throat> Whoops, I went too far here. So let's. So why was the Army-NASA collaboration so important and so significant? What was the real impact of the Army-NASA collaboration at Ames? Well, I would say that, that the collaboration rewrote the book on rotorcraft research, and especially in three main areas, tilt rotor aviation, fundamental air mechanics research, and flight control technology. This first slide shows the impact of the collaboration on the XB-15 and the birth of tilt rotor aviation. I think I'm probably running a little fast here, but it, the picture in the upper right shows Paul Yagi and Hans Mark, the director of Ames, selling the program to the Army generals at AMC and at AFSCOM. Uh, some, some key events. Uh, Yagi and, and uh, other folks here sold the idea at NASA. Uh, Yagi and Dean Borgman, a key Army official, ended up as CEO of Sikorsky Aircraft, cultivated Army officials to fund the tilt rotor neither of which Army or NASA could have done alone. And I want to mention a key event. Wayne Johnson developed prop rotor stability methodology that really addressed the stumbling blocks that the XB-3 had encountered. And these were later validated in full-scale one-ton tests. And these are semi-span rotors shown in the lower left. So we ended up with the XB-15. Uh, Mike uh, Scully and his design team uh, laid the groundwork for the JVX and the B-22 Osprey with their design studies. Uh, so Ames really was, you know, the reason why the tilt loader got started. And all of these pictures from Irv Stadler's chapter, uh, he did a lot of promotion. The aircraft went to the Paris Air Show, and he got influ influential people to fly in the aircraft. There's Senator Barry Goldwater and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Bessie at the time, with personally autographed pictures to Irv from those gentlemen. Now, in the dynamics area, I'm sorry, in the rotorcraft aeromechanics area, there were many fundamental accomplishments that led to the Ames Army reputation. There were seminal discoveries about by Jim and his team about boundary layer phenomena, dynamic stall, and rotor weight phenomena. They kind of wrote the book on dynamic stall. Same with Frank Caradonna starting off the CFD activities. In his book, he tells about how he would break into the NASA Computer Center on weekends so he could run his big CFD programs. And that was the start when Ames was getting into CFD. In dynamics, we looked at fundamental understanding of Ames' rotors and did nonlinear rotor blade structural dynamics, which was kind of a breakthrough at the time. And of course, Rich Schmitz and his folks came up with brand new techniques for studying rotor acoustics, both in the anechoic chamber and in flight tests by measuring noise with a, a quiet airplane. And of course, nowadays people look to the comprehensive analyses that came from Ames, both Camrad and RCAS, and they're kind of the foundations of rotorcraft analysis today. In the, in the flight controls area, when Irv came on board and became director, he started the whole program into flight controls and, and the human factors. And this took off, and it's a major part of the program today. One of the main things that came up that were, 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 was developed was the Army Aeronautical Design Standard, ADS-33. Uh, Dave Key was the one who started that effort. Uh, Chris Blankens in the back, he carried it through. Uh, you can read their chapters on, on this enormous effort. Uh, Mark Tichler, who's going to talk, uh, developed system identification techniques. Cypher is widely used throughout the world. There's a textbook that's written on it, lower right along with some of his co-authors here in the Army. And then I have to mention that the enormously influential advanced design team that Mike Scully spearheaded, and he was in Building 219 in the headquarters. And he, he had such an influence in his group on all the Army new rotorcraft programs that were developed, and then even on the Navy Marines B-22 Osprey. Uh, and he wrote an amazing chapter. Had trouble keeping him down. It's a long chapter, but he's got his story in there, and it's it's a major accomplishment that, that he took the time to do that. So I'll wrap up with, we hoped we were going to tell the world how to do everything, but just a few lessons I think we learned. 
uh, Irv would attest that the interagency collaboration really was made to work, uh, and it, it can pay off if you make it work. You just need to attract exceptional people, and I think we did on so many levels. Uh, a supportive environment existed, and the management had to trust in the skills and instincts of the people. I think the Army benefited tremendously from the principles and methods developed by NACA and NASA. Uh, it was important that there be a, a, a good balance between the research and the applications, or the researcher's interest in the user requirements. You need to apply your work to the Army user, but you also need to support the long-term research. As far as R&D planning goes, Paul Yagi had a thing he liked to say, the researcher at the best knows, the researcher, researcher at the bench knows best. He should figure out what he's going to be doing. And also, something I learned, that fundamental research is not schedule driven. At one point, Herb came into my office and said, Jim is still working on the dynamic stall. When is this ever going to end? Uh, that was his management hat. That was his only failing through the entire time. I want to recognize, I, I think Barry Legasmith might have come in at the end, but he wrote a tremendous epilogue. He brought the book, which covered the period from nominally 65 to 85, up to date, and he talked about how that connects with the current scene and all of the changes that have taken place. So when I look at the future and I look back on this book, I think, gee, it's a, is, is it about the future versus the good old days? And the older you get, you look back on how good the old days were. The Army at Ames is not the same as it was in 65, 85, or even now. And we don't know what the future holds. We never can know what it is. But I think it's clear, if we stick to the principles that led to the success of the Army Ames Lab, the future will remain bright. So. Let me end there, but let me acknowledge some key people. First of all, and, and this is Irv and I together, all of the authors, a tremendous effort by all of them. And both of us are spouses who put up a lot while we got thoroughly embroiled in the deep weeds of this project. And I can't say enough for Bill Mornbrot. Uh, he, he helped on so many levels. Support, funding, and then all kinds of encouragement. Just build my hands off to you. Barry Lake and Smith, uh, for the same reasons. Uh, Kathy Yagi Hemingway, who's here, is going to speak with us. Uh, the daughter of Paul. It's just so great to have her here, and she can share with you a little bit about but Paul. Um, Tom Snyder, also for his guidance, tremendous chapter from his point of view on the NASA side and the relationship with the Army. <coughs> Kathy Dow, I mentioned her, and then Meredith Siegel and Bill's group, who handle the interface with the Publications Office and the G. So with that, uh, thank you all uh, from Irv and I. Uh, at this point, we have hopefully some time left. I'm not sure how long I took, but a few of the authors are going to speak, and I told them to stick to that four or five minutes. Uh, so I'm going to ask these individuals to come up uh, and use the microphone and, and say a few things about their experience. I didn't tell them what to say. I just said focus on the army NASA relationship, but it's their story. I guess I should note that Frank is going to start, and those dates reflect the time they first joined the Army or NASA organization. because they say when you retire, you, you know, you have all the time in the world. Well, not this last week. We, we had a surprise birthday party for, for, for Monica. And I won't tell you which date it was, but it, but it wasn't 70, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so anyhow, the family is finally, is finally all, all left, and, and, we, and I've got about this morning to think about what I'm going to say. And uh, I noticed the date there, uh, 1970. To the best of my knowledge, uh, my first day uh, reporting for duty, uh, I'm 
Building 215 was on June 20th, 1970, and a uh, very important day in my life. But it wasn't my first contact with the Army Labs. Uh, roughly five years before, I had been a, a student uh, summer worker at Ames in a group called the Manned Spacecraft Simulation Branch. And I heard towards the, towards when I was ready, getting ready to go back to classes, that there was an army group there. Uh, and so I went over and talked to someone, it may have been her. Uh, and um, I don't remember what I said other than introducing myself. And next thing I know, four and a half years later, I'm in, I was in ROTC and I was, I was now in the, uh, Ordnance Officer School at Aberdeen Proving Ground. It's graduation day and everybody's getting their orders. And while everybody else was getting orders for Vietnam, I got orders to go to the uh, Army Aeronautical Group at Ames Research Center. And I said, I'll take that. <laughs> so, so a week later, there I was, coming uh, June, June 20th, and I come up to the, the stairs, and as Bob mentioned, I was almost knocked over by Georgine Lop on her, on her unicycle. <laughs> and uh, I met later on that day uh, a, lot, a whole lot of people, I can't remember them all, but the most important one was, uh, was Andy, Andy, uh, Andy Morris. Uh, he showed me the wind tunnel, he, he showed me the, the nice computer room and uh, introduced me to, to Paul. I was very impressed with Paul and a little bit intimidated because, because he looked like he really meant business and I was thinking to myself, boy, I better, I better, better be good for this guy. Anyhow, that summer was, well, you know, the thing that stands out is no one said, this is what you've got to do. Rather, I was given an assignment, and it wasn't called an assignment, but it was clear that I was supposed to find something. <laughs> something. Because in those days we knew next to nothing. And uh, and you know, I must admit, knowing nothing is a lot of fun. Because <laughs> because you can you, you can do anything you want. And I spent that summer searching a lot of these projects, reading, Andy would bring in these papers for me to read. And uh, and every so often, check up, how's your reading going? Uh, by the way, that was a standard technique of Andy's, uh, to come in in the morning with his coffee, and we'd have coffee together and talk about nothing in particular, but in reality, he was sizing up how things were going, and we were, let, we were filling him in. And it was all very collegial and, and friendly. And by the way, one of those pictures, the one of Fred with Andy, I noticed they had their coffee cups with them. And I think, therefore, that may be the most important of all those pictures there. Because Andy really set the, the tone, the attitude. He was running the whole place. The, the wind tunnel was answering to him and everybody. Uh, but we just felt that it was our job. You said that, that Paul would say that that the, the worker at the bench knows best what to do. All I knew, uh, I guess that was communicated to me because I felt I had a personal responsibility to do something. And so I, we took our work personally. And so one of the topics I was looking at that summer uh, was uh, the high-speed flow on advancing rotors. And uh, I started finding some analytical papers and, and trying out some of the methods I was reading. Uh, some just wouldn't work and finally towards the end of the summer I found this delightful paper. I don't know who brought it to me. It might have been Jim uh, by uh, Earl Merman on, on uh, small perturbation potential numerical solutions. And I tried that out and by October I had the code working, and I remember Andy, and it was at the end of the day, coming by and hearing me mumbling to myself, and said, hey Frank, what's, what's going on? And I showed him, this would be, we would get these visitors, uh, 
We had summer students coming. One of them was a young kid from, from Berkeley called Bill Ballhouse. And, and he worked that summer with, with me, helping me uh, program some various things. Another one was a professor from NYU, uh, Morris Eisen. And uh, that was the beginning of a lifelong friendship. Uh, my first paper was together with Morris, uh, where he derived the 3D uh, small uh, perturbation equations for rotors. And, uh, and I solved them using the, uh, the, uh, the 360, uh, the, uh, the, the computer over in the computer center. What was it? Was it? Is that what they would call the 360? I forgot now. <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but Morris, uh, if you don't, I don't know how many of you knew him, but sadly he passed away last year. Uh, uh, he was a wonderful friend, and, and he was one of those persons you would sit down and talk with him, and, and he would explain things to you and, and give you all kinds of ideas. And, and we knew so many people like that. Now that wasn't just Morris. We were a part of Ames Research Center and we had the run of the place. There wasn't any place where we couldn't go and see what was going on. We'd go over to, I remember going over to the 6x6 wind tunnel and watching uh, the uh, aircraft being tested there. It was so much fun to watch the shocks on them. Or we'd go to the 2x2 two two tunnel and I'd talk with uh, with uh, loose divers over there, a very famous experimentalist, and, and uh, the 40 by 80, we had the run of the place, and we lived, at least I lived, in the wonderful library that Ames had. It was a, it was a marvelous place. Now, I'm supposed to only talk five minutes, and so I'm going to stop, uh, but let me say that in, that in those 10 years I'm, that I have in my mind right now, the 70s, this lab really came to life. In 1970, we really didn't know anything. But by the end of that time, we, we still didn't know a heck of a lot, but we knew where we were going. You know, I, we had a plan for how to go, where to go with transonic flow. The numerical work we had to develop, the, the, the experimental work to validate that. And, and Jim it, it did his marvelous dynamic stall Work and Bob with his uh, with his uh, dynamic stability and Fred had gotten started with his uh, with his uh, high speed impulsive noise work and 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 there was a world of difference between 1970 and 1980 and I'll never forget those years and it happened because of the people that we had we 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 got so many wonderful people through the Army and the ROTC program. I was an ROTC, Ken McAllister was an ROTC, DC. I, Bill Bowsman was ROTC, uh, Jim McCroskey, uh, a, a ton of us. What, a, what an opportunity that was to, to get people. And, uh, and uh, then we had the Ames, we had the culture of Ames, we had the shops. Uh, whenever we had a question, we knew exactly where to go and who to ask. And so, and so we could move fast, and, and we were unhindered by, by red tape, uh, no paperwork. I, nowadays, we have safety committees, planning committees. Uh, I, I remember one time, uh, this was a few years later, when, when Young, Young Yu was the branch chief. I, I, I remember I was just starting a, 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 a high-speed rotor test, and we were coming back from lunch. <laughs> and I said to the young, hey young, by the way, have you seen this rotor test I'm doing? He said, what rotor test? <laughs> he didn't even know I was doing it. <laughs> and, I mean, what a difference. So we did things very quickly in those days. And I consider myself blessed for having been a part of that. Okay, and now I think I'll introduce our next speaker, and that's our dear Andy Kerr. <laughs> Good morning still. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, when you get to a certain age, uh, your short-term memory, uh, I, I want to show you my short-term memory. 
This is computer stuff. <laughs> there it is, right there. <laughs> all this because we'll be here all the time. So I, I have a piece of paper with a couple keywords on it. Uh, and the first keyword is, uh, I first encountered uh, the laboratory here in 1967. Uh, I had work, been working cradle to tomb on, on the Cheyenne helicopter for Lockheed. And we were doing advanced concepts. And uh, uh, because of the fact that uh, uh, Andy Morse was up here and uh, Dave Sharp, they were working uh, with the uh, research group up here, um, the Lockheed wind tunnel was full and I had to come somewhere to do a very important test for advanced concept stops, code, folded rotor. And uh, uh, there was some time available in the set by 10. So I was set with a model and a, and a mechanic to come up and do a test. And at that point I met Andy, I met Dave Sharp, I met Paul Yagi, and we went and we did a test. And it was a, a wonderful experience for me because it was a lot of flexibility. We invented our, our instrumentation as we went along, and it was uh, so I, I had a great in, uh, introduction to this organization, or what turned out to be the, the, the organization in the end. And uh, so I knew what it was. And uh, one of the reasons that happened is that uh, it wouldn't have happened except that I was uh, working with Dick Carlson down at Lockheed, and he had known that Andy and uh, Dave had come here when they uh, had, had them uh, killed. So uh, uh, I knew all about it, but I didn't know much about what it was because I was just one of these industry guys who was uh, uh, doing airplanes. Um, but that uh, um, I'm not going to talk much about the, the technical results of things. I want to talk a little bit more about the collaboration because, as Service pointed out, this is the absolutely unique approach that has made everything that this organization has been able to do over the years happen and to put it on the, 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 uh, uh, on the map as the number one place for doing uh, photograph research uh, in the United States of America, in the world, I guess I would say. And uh, that uh, I, I did come here to join uh, the headquarters organization as the aeromechanics specialist uh, on the uh, uh, Advanced Systems Research Office, the, the planning for the Army Aviation Laboratories. And that brought me in close proximity here, but also took me out to uh, all of the other uh, Army labs. Um, one of the things that was really interesting was in around uh, approaching 1970, Dick Ballard, who was uh, uh, one of the leaders in the Pentagon for the Army for Army Aviation, he came to Dick Carlson and he and he said, uh, all of our professors and stuff on the on the Army Science Board are timing out on age. We really need to get a bunch of new young talent in here and bring them along. And uh, who would you recommend? Because we went to colleges and got people to do that. At which point, uh, Dick and I sat down and we looked at all these things and, and uh, we finally said, there aren't any uh, you know, 35 year old scientists in universities anymore working on rotorcraft because we hired them all. <laughs> and uh, here they were. All of the top people in their field were right here uh, at Ames. Uh, a few of them at Langley as well. But uh, this was all because the Army came to a conclusion that the Air Force is coming to a conclusion about now, and that is that you need to have some people who know something about the science and technology of something that they need to build and use. And uh, the Army saw that early, the serendipity of the fact that NASA was getting out, of the space business a bit and had excess capacity, was wonderful. But it also led to uh, a wonderful time to make a cooperation. And the cooperation was, it was in everybody's interest to make this work. In those days, it still drove the accountants crazy because they couldn't understand how this could possibly work because uh, there wasn't a balance sheet that they could see. And uh, uh, that particular problem, uh, uh, came to bite us much later uh, when uh, 
in, in the old days, every time there was a, a serious audit done by anybody on the work of the laboratory, uh, they said, this makes a lot of sense. This interagency collaboration is uh, unique and it works. Don't mess with it. Well, Earth continued to mess with it and make it better and better all the time. One of the things that Earth did was uh, he integrated so well with the management here. Uh, and one of, one of the things that was most important about this whole collaboration is that uh, not only did we share facilities, but we also shared uh, uh, we, we shared the credit for things that was done. Uh, it, things that were done out here weren't done by just NASA or just done by the Army. They were done by this organization that could pull all these things together and make them happen. Another interesting thing about the collaboration uh, was that uh, we could use and play the bureaucracy uh, from both organizations in order to get the job done. If it worked better at NASA, we'd do it the NASA way. If the Army couldn't promote somebody uh, and there was a job available, uh, they'd become a NASA person and be promoted, or vice versa. All these things worked. They were all off the books. Nobody had them on there. We ran into some problems later on, however, when uh, uh, the entire government was taken over by, uh, by the bean counters. And um, we were trying to hold things together uh, when NASA went on Folk Costa County. And uh, that was really interesting because um, it, the accountants got together and decided that the Army was getting a $10 million deal here at, at, uh, at Ames. And uh, um, uh, at that point, we were worried about that because uh, they, they sent me a bill <laughs> for $10 million. <laughs> and uh, I didn't have $10 million. Um, so we, we tried to just do this by, uh, by the way we'd always done before, cooperative discussion. But in, that, in those days, the most important thing was coming right down from uh, the, uh, the headquarters at NASA, and that was full cost was the way it was going to be, and everybody was having problems with it. Um, as it turns out, that uh, um, uh, we took a look at what we provided NASA in terms of our contribution, and uh, NASA, um, if you added it up, it was like six million dollars worth of stuff. They wanted to send me a bill for 12 or 10 million, and I didn't think that was a good idea. We went and studied exactly what the laws are about, uh, um, uh, about how, you, uh, uh, how you charge people for things when you have a facility. And it turns out there was a law, and for everything that the Air Force was giving for uh, uh, NASA at Dryden, they were paying $2 million a year. When those people got together and they did all the stuff, and there's a law that says that they couldn't charge more than that. And so uh, we felt a real squeeze there, and it was a squeeze that meant that we had to kind of uh, uh, unintegrate. So we, we took some things that were integral to the way we made new business, and we took them out of there. And that made, made things much more difficult because by the time we were finished, the Army paid a bill for $2 million a year instead of the $7 million worth of uh, support we've been giving. But uh, in the long run, uh, everything is still working that way. And everybody is still here doing their research because of the groundwork that was laid by Paul Yagi, Herb Statler, Dick Carlson, and the people at NASA headquarters and, and the Pentagon who could understand what we were doing as opposed to just getting their uh, accountant to look out and see what happened. So uh, congratulations for getting to inherit uh, what's going on, and it's really great to see it continuing as uh, uh, we move on. Thank you, Andy. Uh, <coughs> I'm looking, there's a lot of young people here. Uh, only the gray hair sitting in the front. 
<laughs> what we are talking about is uh, 40 or 70, uh, 50 years ago stuff, which means uh, for the older foggy like me or you common <laughs> like you guys, uh, basically it's a memory, which is what we have talked about is what we have done many years ago. That's why the old people full of is memory. <clears throat> Let's go to the beginning. When I joined in 78, uh, it's, uh, it's in the middle of my life. Before that, uh, when I graduated, I was hired by Dr. Irv Steller to Cornell Aeronautical Laboratory. At that time, I go there, the group of people at the Cornell Aeronautical Laboratory is doing rotocraft. I didn't know back in the 60s, that's the leading research organization in helicopter. <clears throat> Later on, back in, back in uh, 72, uh, Earth left uh, around 1970 to join the army here. And he gave me a call. He says, uh, we have an opening, and uh, are you interested in working in the West Coast? Because at that time, we live in Buffalo. The snow is really got to be. I said, hey, that's a good idea. We should, uh, <coughs> should go to West. The next, the next uh, couple of weeks, I have a call. He said, sorry, your job has been frozen by President Nixon. <laughs> so, OK, so be it. And uh, back in 79, Jim McCloskey called me. And he says, we have a job over here. Are you interested? I said, well, this time I should not give up. So I come. They, they invite me to give a talk. So I come back to, to Ames. The first thing I find out is I have a good classmate called Larry Carr. He's sitting in my presentation, I said, well, this is a good place, I have to, to, to come. So the next thing is, I just uh, mentioned to my wife, that's a pack to go west. That's why I joined the army back. Take seven years to join the army. Uh, actually, join the army, it's a great turning point in my life. Once I come to the, <coughs> to the, to, to, to Ames, I suddenly realized I used to do analytical work. You know, it's always a pencil and a paper. But looking around, the facility, the internal facility, and also the infrastructure to support the research work is tremendous. So I just changed myself to become an experimentalist. So what's really boiled down is doing the good, the good research here, there's the three factors. This, <clears throat> the first one is the vision of the management. They give you the freedom to do what you like to do within certain boundary. That means helicopter to road. Within these big topics, you have all the freedom. For example, like the dynamic stall work, like the dynamic stability issue, like acoustics. And the, the management is says, just go ahead. Uh, if you need money, we find money. You need people, we provide people for you. The second one is the teamwork. You know, among all the researchers, we share ideas. Uh, we will not say, uh, this is my credit or something. We share we share the common interest to work together. Uh, I think that's the teamwork is, uh, you cannot avoid. The third one is the unsung heroes, the infrastructure, like the instrument shop, model shop, machine shop. They support our work. Okay, so I just want to be too long. Uh, I'm just very happy to remember back uh, 40 years ago, come to here, uh, really changed my life. Thank you.
Okay, Andy, I refuse to go into short-term memory, but I'm with you. Um, I'm obviously not Paul Yagi. Um, so when Bob and Irv approached me to do this, it was like, are you serious? I am not my dad. And I couldn't do the real technical parts, but dad had passed away, and so um, they convinced me that I could bring the personal part. And I thought, okay, I can do this. So let's see what I can do. I wrote the chapters, a lot of information in there. I could talk to you for hours about my dad, but I won't do that. But let me give you a couple of fun facts. Uh, dad started at the 40 by 80, worked there for years. And when the Army was going to establish the Army lab um, here at Ames, they approached Dad about being the technical director. And he was mulling it over and thinking about it. And he came over to dinner one night which he had to be home for every night, by the way. Um, and he said that they had offered him the job, and he wasn't sure about it, but at the time he was working for Woody Cook, and Woody had said, you know, Paul, I'm sorry, you don't have any opportunity of any kind of promotion here, so you probably should take it. <laughs> and of course he was laughing, because he knew that was Woody's way of saying, you better take that job. So he did, and he worked there, and then um, later on became the uh, director. And then, as you've heard, became involved in the uh, development collaboration, uh, the development of the collaboration and the planning, etc. So as they decided to do this, they approached him again and asked him if he would be the director of the new collaboration organization. But the headquarters were in St. Louis. So he came home one night again for dinner and sat around and said that he had this job opportunity and what did we think. And they have to understand there was four daughters, all teenagers, and my mother who hated the snow. And there was mutiny in the house, and every one of us said, sorry, Dad, if you want to do that, you're going to be living in the snow by yourself. Ain't doing it. So, and his older parents had just moved across the street. So family was the most important to my dad. So he made the decision to turn the job down. And later on, they came back and they said, well, Paul, we'd like you to reconsider if we move the headquarters out here to Ames, would you take the job? And he said, of course. So you can thank my bratty sisters and me for the fact that this is now here at Ames. Um, so um, later on, he, uh, he was a, a man that you could not have believed. His ability to deal with people was amazing. He loved people, he, and he got involved in who they were, not just what they did. And um, he can tell you stories, and they can tell you stories, too, about the interest that he had, the railroads, the, the um, history, anything. It didn't matter. He was interested in that, as well as their technical capabilities. One thing I'm not sure everybody knew about, or even probably maybe nobody knows about my dad, is my dad had a, a feeling of inferiority around most of you folks. My dad, because family was so important to him, never really had the time to uh, pursue his advanced degrees. So he never had the alphabet soup behind his name or in front of his name like so many of you do. And that was intimidating to him in many ways. And yet he was so amazing at opening the doors for people so that they could walk through those doors with their talent, their abilities, and just blossom. And he just reveled in the glory of what they were able to accomplish. And that meant so much to him. So I think he sort of lived vicariously through all your alphabet soups um, and what you were able to do. He was a very humble man, and that came across in his leadership. He was a very strong leader, but um, always gave glory to the folks around him and always built them up. Um, he, in, I think it was 1967, was invited to be on the Agard panel. And that opened up a lot of the international activities for him, which he then later uh, developed on that. I'll tell you that a little, little bit later. But um, he loved that part of it. And I think that's where a lot of the MOU stuff came from, is because he, he loved working with people from all cultures, all areas, all knowledge. He didn't care if it was the janitor or the president of the United States. He treated them the same. And he had this ability to look at people and say, OK, Somebody doesn't see as talent in them, but I do. And so he was able to bring them in and build them up and allow them to develop to the point where they did develop. And so many of them, so many of folks have gone on to do some amazing things, and, and even at the lab, amazing things. 
But that was his talent, and he loved being out with people. One of his favorite things was food. He loved to eat. And I got in a lot of trouble with that, but... Um, and I'll tell you why I pulled that together. Because behind my dad was this red-headed woman that he married. And she was the force of his life. And she was the one that held the family together. She was the one that held him together in many ways and helped him to balance his life. And um, she took care of him, made sure that he stayed balanced with his family, with his church, and um, here at the lab. And one of the things that happened one time, we still laugh about this, but my mom was ill. And I needed to go pick my dad up at the airport from a trip. And I, he stepped off the airplane and he was bright yellow, like a lemon. And I said, oh, my goodness, we have a problem here. So I rushed him home. My mom rushed him to the hospital. And he had gotten hepatitis from some oysters he had eaten in Texas. So he was in the hospital for a week and bedridden for five weeks. And during that time, um, the doctor says, nobody, no work. I want to rest. And you are contagious. Nobody's to be here. Well, I happened to be the nurse that day, because Mom had to go to work, and I got my marching orders that under no circumstances any more work was coming into this house, and he was going to get his rest. I had captain, so she leaves, and a couple hours later, the door, there was a knock at the door, and I opened the door. Irv, I don't know if you remember this, but <laughs> it was Irv Stadler with a package of work for Dad. And I'm sorry, but I had my marching orders, so I said, I'm sorry, you cannot come in this house. I will not take that package. I hope you have a good day. And I closed the door. <laughs> because you see, you have to understand that I was more afraid of this redheaded woman than I was the U.S. government. <laughs> Gives you an idea of what was behind my dad. Um, when it came time for my dad to make the decision to move on, uh, it was a very difficult decision for him. He was up all night praying. Um, he felt that the Lord was calling him someplace else. And he also felt that he had built this organization to the point where it could sustain itself and move forward and continue to grow. So he finally turned in his resignation and he moved on. And he moved on to a position at Calvary Church and also later on at OC International, which is an international missions organization. And he served as president there for many years. But he always used the skills that he gained here and the cantankerous people that he worked for. Now, you also have to understand, you can also thank us for that because he raised four daughters and nothing could get past that for me. So thank you can thank us for that one as well. But um, he always looked back at this opportunity and this tenure here as one of the best, one of the most amazing in his life. Um, the Clement Award was something very special to him. The people he worked with, uh, he kept friendship with everybody that he knew over those years, even the people from the other countries. He would, even past retirement, would uh, visit with them, and they would visit here as well. He just had this knack with people to bring the best out. He was able to listen very well. In fact, the elder board at church used to always say, you know, Paul doesn't say much, but when Paul Yogi speaks, everybody stops and listens. And so he kind of had that re reputation as well. But it was really his ability to look at people as people, uh, find the good in them, find the, the uh, potential in them, open the doors for them, and just kind of get out of the way. And he loved doing that. And I think one of the things that you have to understand with him is, and, and I'm not sure if any of you know this, but um, he prayed for every one of you every night. So he had that as well. He, he had that to offer. So um, I'm going to lose this. I'm really bad about this. Um, I miss my dad a lot, sorry. Uh, so anyway, so it was, a, it was a, a hard thing to write when I first started to write this thing, but I got to realize this man had a leadership capability that was amazing. He carried it on throughout. But I remember when we came home from the day that he was inducted into the NASA Hall of Fame, one of the things that he said was, I wish the whole team had been there because this is a team award. This team built this, this team deserves this, and I take it for the team. So I think he was the right leader at the right time, and he got this whole started off, and you guys have just taken it from there, and I think you should be extremely proud of what you've done. And thanks for the opportunity. And Tom Schneider, you are up. <laughs> Paul Yagi, intimidated by anyone, except perhaps that red-headed lady you mentioned, 
I am really pleased to see that there are this many rotor heads still around here. <laughs> it's great. You know, when, uh, oh, also I want to thank Bob and Irv for conceiving of and driving this project and coming up with this tremendous product. Thank you both very much. I know it was a rocky road. You know, when Irv and Bob uh, first mentioned to me or invited me to be one of the contributing authors, I jumped at the chance because one of the things they said was, we want to try to capture what it was like working at Ames in the early days and the excitement there. And that really hit a chord with me because I titled my uh, uh, chapter A Dream Career. And uh, that was because as a boy, I was an airplane buff. And the chance to go to work for NASA when I got out of college was an absolute dream come true. And so this opportunity to try to reflect that excitement really uh, was something I wanted to do. I also was convinced of the uh, uh, tremendous uh, advances in research and technology that this joint collaboration produced. And so the opportunity to try to illustrate some of that was a driving force as well. When I first came to work at Ames, I quickly realized that uh, it was a tremendous, exciting, and stimulating place. And the two key things to me was the tremendous people here. The people were just great. Their competency was high, and their uh, personal interest and uh, was really good. They all were very willing to help, and uh, that was a big plus. The other thing was the world-class research facilities that existed here and the, the opportunities we had to make use of those. I'm not going to go into any detail on the uh, products of the, the uh, collaboration other than, than to say that uh, you know, the ability to combine resources to do something you couldn't do otherwise was one often touted, and the XP-15 is definitely uh, one of those. There were many management advantages. Uh, the uh, uh, enabling of and upgrading of key facilities couldn't have been done without the Army's involvement in many, many cases, and the, the NFAC and the BMS and research aircraft. I mean, the list is very long. Um, I guess I would just like to close with the observation that in this world we live in today, there's so much divisiveness. And this document, I think, is an important reminder of what can be achieved when people, people are willing to work together. Thank you. So Mark Tischler was next. Okay, Mark Tischler. Thank you. Uh, it's great to see everybody and uh, a lot of old friends, Jay and many others here. Um, so uh, I was living in, in LA and enjoying the lifestyle um, from 1980 um, through 1982, and then I got a phone call from uh, Fred Schmitz. Uh, who was wanting to start a uh, simulation division, and said, uh, and he was, and I had worked with uh, with uh, some of the NASA folks uh, here at Euro and others on on uh, airship uh, uh, dynamics, which was a big topic in NASA at the time. And so uh, Hiro Mura um, recommended me to Fred and Nerve, and, and uh, they invited me up for a. Um, uh, you know, for a, for an interview, and um, uh, the two things that were really um, were really draws for me was the opportunity to, to go to school. And at that time, there are many people in this room, and one of the advantages we had was that the Army folks were able to use the 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 uh, NASA uh, uh, graduate co-op program, and so folks like Jay and Hussein and Chris and 
my, and myself and many, many folks in this room who got advanced degrees got them at Stanford. And that was a really great opportunity. So that was, that was a huge uh, requirement. But there was another requirement, and uh, that was I asked them um, whether, the, uh, whether the windsurfing was good, and there was no answer to that. And uh, so I put my uh, windsurfer on, on top of my uh, roof, and I drove up here and uh, checked out the uh, San Francisco Bay, and uh, it turned out to be uh, actually windier than it was in L.A., so that, that, was, a big, uh, that was a big draw. Um, somebody mentioned that, and I think uh, at the very beginning, that um, the bureaucracy wasn't what it was. Uh, the bureaucracy now is much heavier than it was at that time. Um, and I, I think it's yes and no. Um, early in my career, um, uh, I was sitting in the, a really storied organization of, of NASA Flight Dynamics and Control was led by Vic Labax. And there were folks like uh, Chris Blanken and, and um, uh, Jack Franklin and, and um, many others. Uh, Ernie was there at the time, or came very short, shortly thereafter, and, and, and others. And um, it was really a really great opportunity for mentorship. But one day, uh, and I would work very long hours, as I, as I still do, and, Vic, uh, and I had come from STI. Vic was at Calspan, uh, and um, uh, uh, where Irv was. And, um, and so he, he knew what, and, uh, what the difference was between industry and government. Vic said to me, you know, you can't work so hard and expect everybody else to come along with you. you um, the, or, the bureaucracy just doesn't work like that. You have to slow down. And um, um, that, that never happened. But, and and we, we managed to get lots of things done. But it, I think there was just a couple of things I wanted to highlight about the organization that, that still exists. And it's really important that the, the young folks don't think that, yeah, okay, well, all the great opportunities were, were 40 or 50 years ago. I think first was uh, that we had a critical mass of, of uh, you know, the team environment, that Frank mentioned, of mentors and colleagues who are our equals that we could bounce ideas off of. And that still exists. Uh, and, and that's critical. And I don't think it exists anywhere else, especially for Rotocraft, the, the way it exists here, as, as, as Andy pointed out. Uh, and and, and that, was, that was a huge opportunity. I think the opportunity for young folks to get involved, uh, both giving papers uh, in the U.S. as well as being involved in international collaboration was unique. I mean, there's no way that a young guy like myself, uh, you know, had the opportunity to, to go to Germany and, and Irv was wonderful enough uh, and, 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 and Andy to, to encourage me to, to establish the, the Israeli MOA. Um, we were involved in NATO. These were opportunities that, you know, only the senior managers in industry could do. So the, the young folks who have never worked in industry don't realize that, you know, you could work for 20 or 30 years and, and, and never have a chance to do that sort of thing. So that was, it, was, it was a unique uh, opportunity, and, and you still have that opportunity. The ability to go to ERF, the ability to work on M MOUs and things of that nature, it's totally unique. Um, and I think the third thing is is that we sit, and I've always I've always said this, and 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 uh, and, and I think uh, Irv felt this way as well that we we, we kind of sit in the sweet spot between academia that that doesn't really have an application, and a lot of times they're not even sure what their application is, and industry which is totally academic, totally uh, applications focused. So we sit right in the middle. We, can, we, we work a little bit on either side, and I think that's a wonderful place to sit. And that's still the case. We have to, we have to think. We, you know, we have to think a little bit about applications, and, and that helps uh, pull us in certain directions, which is a good thing because we have certain certain things that, that are applied, and that's something that 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 Irv stressed when he was uh, recruiting me. Um, but you know, I think. It, as I look back, and one of the things I like to, to tell young folks now is, I think we're actually in the golden age of autocraft right now. And all these opportunities that, that we had, they were all being applied to a fairly narrow range of configurations at the time. You know, at, at least when I came in the 1980s, you know, there was a tilt rotor, and then there was a standard helicopter. But today we have high-speed concepts. We have advanced attack rotorcraft that look an awful lot like the Cheyenne, as a matter of fact, or compounds. Uh, we have the whole world of EV toll. There are, there are um, uh, uh, UAVs and drones everywhere. There are urban air mobility vehicles. So I believe that 
in, in all disciplines that we're talking about, we're, we're in the golden age of rotocraft right now. And so for the young folks, you really have the, the opportunity to leverage these, these things that were developed uh, uh, to, make, to make great advances. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention was that um, uh, soon after um, uh, the end of this project, which sort of ends in 1985, a little bit, a little bit thereafter, um, uh, uh, Frit, I'm sorry, um, Andy uh, launched uh, a, a strategic planning initiative um, uh, to look at combining the Army and NASA organizations, and, um, and he asked me to lead that, which I'm, I'm forever thankful for. Uh, and he and myself and Ed Aiken uh, uh, led a series of teams to look at different um, organizational structures, and eventually the Army and NASA Rotorcraft Division was formed from 97 to 2005, and lots of great things were done. Uh, and I think we still benefit from a lot of those, a lot of those things that were done. Um, and I want to close um, with, with two, um, with two uh, words of wisdom that, that I always carried around. Um, um, and before, before I do that, I, I want to thank a couple of folks that are in the room that have been dear colleagues my whole life. Um, um, Barry Lakensmith, who I first met when he worked on the strategic planning uh, uh, group together, he and I, and, and, um, and uh, went on to become our, our, uh, our division chief in flight control and then our director. Um, Chris Blanken, a dear colleague uh, for my entire career, from the day I joined, uh, Chris was there uh, and uh, also became a uh, 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 lead in, uh, in flight control. Uh, Dave Key was a lead in uh, flight control. Ed Aiken was a group leader. Hussein uh, came shortly after I did, uh, together with Matt Wally and Jay Fletcher, and now Hussein leads flight control. And so all these folks, uh, I've, uh, uh, again, they, they, they have built this, this wonderful environment. So to get back to the two, uh, um, two words of wisdom or two pearls that my father would love to quote, and, and the first one I, is, the, is, is the one that I named uh, my chapter was I always worried, you know, in the, in, uh, when I graduated from college, um, uh, it was it was a, a very it was one of those cyclical periods where there was a downturn in, in, in aeronautics. And my father said, "If you're good at what you do, there will always be opportunities. The good people will always get picked up, and that's still the case. So, so for the young folks, learn your trade and be good at what you do, and there will always be, you always find opportunities both here and, and outside." And the other thing that my father loved to quote was Mark Twain, who said, "If you love what you do, you never work a day. You will never work a day in your life." And that's and that's true too. And so um, I want to thank um, Irv and, and Bob um, for asking me to be the bookend. Uh, uh, I came right right at the tail end of this of this period, but I'm grateful to 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 all the leadership um, uh, of those early days that, that brought me and gave me wonderful opportunities. Uh, uh, to launch my career and 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 and, uh, and help and help uh, build uh, uh, help help build the organization to where it is today. So with that, um, it's always uh, 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 difficult to come before uh, Bill Warmbrock because he's he's the best entertainer of us all. And and uh, with that, uh, Bill Warmbrock.
as having been an important contributor. Everybody had a different voice. Everybody could uh, create this, uh, the chapters as they wanted. Uh, this is the first time I'm holding in my hands, folks. And uh, let me tell you, uh, the good news about this book, it's in alphabetical order. All right? <laughs> the bad news is my last name starts with W. <laughs> You get, you, get, you, get, you get to pick up this book and you can read whatever chapter you want and then stop and lay it down, think about it, and not even read any more chapters. I've only read one chapter in this book. Maureen Blanken, God bless you for a wonderful chapter. You're welcome. Thank you very much. You know, voices that you may not have listened to in the past, voices you may not have, people you've not have met, voices that will resonate though and will like to know what it is happened here is okay. um, Let's see. Uh, 1965 to 1985. Uh, this is wonderful because it's a 20-year period. There are a lot of voices that have not been incorporated into this book that need to be heard. I look forward to the 1986 to 2005 version, I, volume two. I look forward to version three for another 20 years, and with that and about 150 total authors, between us, we will match Frank Harris. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, this is history. We thank a lot of people here today. Uh, I want to thank each of the authors. I want to thank Irv and Bob. Uh, but uh, we need a perspective. And it, for me, this perspective started at the outset of this activity when I was made aware of it, and that was through Glenn Bugos as the Ames historian. I'd like him to bring this to a close. So, I left Ames about two years ago, but I started in 1998, and my guidance at the time came from two eminent Ames leaders, Jack Boyd and Hans Mark, who said that the way to start into the history of Mass Ames is to look at the Army Ames Rotocraft collaboration. Not only because of the extraordinary contributions that the collaboration made to rotorcraft technology and to the nation, solving the problems of helicopters in Vietnam, the decade-long development of tilt rotors, the fundamental research that's now laying the groundwork for a new generation of electric uh, air taxis, but also because that collaboration exemplified what it was that Ames did best, that sort of spirit of the NACA that started back in the 40s and 50s and continues to some degree even today that sense of collaboration amongst the uses of technology, universities, uh, federal uh, agencies that are doing research, uh, that marriage between fundamental engineering, uh, the computations primarily, and um, the applications in the real world. Um, this ability for Ames people to step back and look at the big picture and find a pathway through. So when I did that, Irv was always, I knew that he was working on his own biography at the time and was always very generous in picking up the phone and answering my questions and I had a lot about how all that worked. But more importantly, I saw Bob in the gym every afternoon about 5 o'clock working off the frustrations of the day on the bike. He usually had a book in front of him reading and then and was always very engaged in those. And one day the conversation shifted from a book that he was reading to one that he was writing. And I knew that it, that was going to be the tenor of the conversation for the next couple years as he was confronting the challenges of the rock, which is NASA's many different style guides and the hard place of uh, authors that have very strong opinions about how it was that they want to voice their opinions. So I knew that it was a struggle that both he and Irv were going to confront, but I knew that there was no way it would fail because they had the backing of Bill Warmbrot. You know, I've heard Bill give his explanations of how it is that the Army uh, helicopters got their names. I've heard him introduce uh, Army Air Force officers with explanations about how the collaboration goes back many decades. I knew that he trained the next generation of rotorcraft researchers and uh, through his internships and that a lot of that dealt with understanding the history of everything that came before. So I knew that it was going to succeed. And uh, I think I, like many of you, are probably amazed at, at what a success this is. I mean, this is unique in how it is that NASA does its history books. Um, it's a big book. It's got 39 authors. The fact that the authors didn't revolt at one point and say, I'm doing my own book, is remarkable. The fact that there's some sort of consistent tone to it um, is also remarkable. Professional historians have a name for the sort of work that's done here. 
It's called prospography, which is basically a biography of a group. Um, usually that, you know, are uh, professional societies, you know, like is meeting here, where you can define people in terms of their, their, um, their coming together to solve a particular problem. But it's a very difficult thing for professional historians to do, and I think if Bob and Irv knew that, they probably would not have started this. But I'm glad that once they did start, they were able to, to uh, get it out the door. And I think when you read it, you know, you're going to see the life stories of a lot of people that you know and admire, and you're going to see how their careers fit into the whole of the development. One thing that I think is remarkable about the book is how they, all the authors, and Bob and Irv put it together, um, very nicely combined um, the history of the organizational with the history of the technical. That's a very difficult thing to do, but when you're dealing with an organization defined by collaboration, looking at basic research, fundamental engineering, and um, applications, you've got to do that or the, the book doesn't hold and it holds together very well. So I see that there's some people in the audience who are under the age of 50. Um, already you're working on topics that are just as significant as the authors uh, that are written up in the book here. 20 years from now, when you think about retiring, you'll probably think a little bit about the significance. After you actually retire, you'll be able to dust off your Rolodex or whatever it is at the time and call up the friends who are sitting with you in this room and ask how you can parcel out the story into usable pieces. Know that when you do that, Art will still be willing to pick up the phone and answer your questions. Bob will still be found at the gym wanting to talk about books that he's either reading or writing. And Bill will still be the longest tenure branch chief in the federal service and we'd be happy to write you a check. Um, so just know that think of this not as an end of the conversation, but really it's beginning. Uh, that all of you in here who have contributed and who will contribute are, are responsible for moving forward. So uh, if I could just say, Herb and Bob, thank you very much for the incredible contribution. And all the authors who are here today, thank you very much for the incredible contribution. You don't have to stand in a long line to so just write your name, your number, and address, and we'll get a book to you. Um, and uh, please join us in the museum for um, lunch and also free admission to the museum. And if you're not an F VFS member, it's $10, but you should really be a member. So <laughs> please, please join in. Um, thank you so much. Um, How about Oh, I'm sorry, that's exactly what I was about to say. And if you're an author and you're here, please come up. I want a group picture. This is a very special event and very important for all of us. So um, please come up and uh, let's take a picture of you guys, all right? And uh, the museum is across the street to the right. <laughs>